we'll, we'll begin as soon as the ranking member gets here. So. Good morning. The uh, committee will come to order. Um, on behalf of the Small Business Committee, I first want to uh, welcome um, our newest representative uh, to this committee, uh, John Curtis from the uh, great state of Utah. And he's uh, right down on my right, your left. Uh, he was sworn in as a member of the House uh, earlier this month and recently uh, joined our committee. Uh, his experience as mayor of Provo and commitment to providing relief to small businesses will be an asset uh, to this committee. There's no question about that. We look forward to working with him and to provide solutions uh, for America's small businesses. And welcome aboard. Great to have you. Um, and I would like to yield about 30 seconds uh, uh, to my colleague from Texas, uh, if he would like to. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me uh, come in here and, and sit down and just just say thank you for having this hearing. It's, uh, it's I think it's very necessary. Uh, as the sponsor of the ELD uh, mandate delay, uh, I would just say that, uh, and I've been a small businessman my entire career as a dentist and as, also as a, as a truck driver. I was a former truck driver at one point in time, and I think the backbone of our economy is small business. And uh, we, uh, we have, as Republicans, as conservatives, as pro-business, and many of my Democrat colleagues as well, uh, I think it's imperative that, that we all uh, look out for the small businessman because uh, he's the one uh, who is risking uh, his, his, uh, his lifeblood, his, his family, his, uh, his investments, and this is, uh, this is where most, most people work at small businesses across this country. And uh, rolling back a lot of this uh, overregulation, I think, is something that is very, very important. Uh, and I'm not even asking for a rollback. We're just asking for a delay until we can work a lot of these bugs out, uh, some of these questions uh, on the ELDs uh, that have been, been uh, are going to be mandated here uh, next month, just a few days before Christmas. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me be here. I w I'd be willing to answer any questions uh, if, if that's necessary. Um, uh, otherwise, I'm going to have to get back to a, uh, a science here, uh, environmental uh, hearing, okay? You can go, but Thank no you. committee is more important than this committee, so we <laughs> sure you appreciate it. We do appreciate you being here, and uh, Mr. Babin is the original sponsor of the ELD Extension Act of 2017, um, and I want to thank the ranking member uh, uh, for having agreed to allow him to participate, and yeah, I think he's kind of already participated, but, uh, but thank you very much for, for that. We appreciate it. Um, and uh, the Small Business Committee is here uh, today to examine how regulatory, uh, federal regulations affect small businesses in the trucking industry. Uh, the trucking industry plays a critical role in the U.S. economy. America's businesses rely on its transport and deliver all types of goods and products, including consumer goods, fuel, food, machinery, and raw materials, among others. Without the trucking industry, our economy literally couldn't function. Uh, the industry produces more than $700 billion in revenue. Uh, trucking companies also provide over 7 million jobs in this country, uh, which is 6% of all the jobs in America. Small businesses make up the majority of the trucking industry. In fact, 97% of trucking companies operate fewer than 20 trucks. Many of these trucking companies are owner-operators, a, a one-person business, essentially. As this committee knows all too well, one of the biggest challenges facing America's small businesses today is complying with federal regulations. With many regulations taking a one-size-fits-all approach, small trucking companies are forced to comply with expensive, confusing, and oftentimes time-consuming regulations. 
This is not only costing small businesses, but America's economy as a whole, through lost time and delays in receiving all types of goods and products. There are many agencies that regulate the trucking industry. Uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration uh, is one of the main agencies that regulates small trucking companies. Uh, in fact, uh, according to uh, uh, to it, 99 percent of the motor carriers that it regulates are considered small entities. Um, but the FMCSA is not the only one with the power to regulate small trucking companies. Agencies such as the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, the uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the National Highway Safety Administration all have the authority to regulate uh, small trucking companies, and they do. While it is important to make sure that our roads and drivers are safe, needless regulations on small businesses can pile up and cost so much that it puts it can literally on occasion put them out of business. We need to ease the regulatory burden on small businesses and make sure that agencies are considering how their regulations will affect America's small businesses. That's why I sponsored legislation that would provide regulatory relief to small businesses. H.R. 33, the Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act of 2017 would ensure that federal agencies actually examine how their new regulations would impact small businesses and require them to consider ways to reduce unnecessary costs and burdens. This bill was included in a larger bill, H.R. 5, uh, the Regulatory Accountability Act of 2017, uh, which passed the House with a bipartisan vote back in January. The Senate has introduced a similar bill, S-584, which we hope will be taken up soon, as this is an important step toward easing the regulatory burden on small businesses. I've also co-sponsored, as a number of us have, H.R. 3282, the ELD Extension Act of 2017, uh, again offered by our colleague from, from Texas, uh, Brian Babin, which would delay the effective date of a regulation requiring electronic logging devices in commercial motor vehicles and provide small firms with more time to comply. Our witnesses today will provide real examples of what it's like for small trucking companies to navigate the confusing regulatory landscape. The chair is uh, aware that there may be difference of opinion from some organizations on some of the regulations that will be discussed in today's uh, hearing in particular from the American uh, Trucking Association. <laughs> to accommodate them, we are providing them the opportunity to submit a statement uh, that will become part of the official hearing record and I will review these statements myself when they are received. Uh, and I'd encourage other members of the committee to review uh, that statement as well. And I want to thank our witnesses for being here and taking time away from uh, their businesses to travel uh, to Washington and testify uh, about their experiences before the committee. And I would uh, now like to yield to the ranking member uh, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The trucking industry is a critical component of our nation's transportation network. Trucking connects industries and consumers, stimulating economic activity in every corner of the country and creating new markets for entrepreneurs. According to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, trucks annually transport 10 billion tons of freight valued at more than $720 billion in revenue. This economic engine is predominantly comprised of small business operators, with 90% of firms having fewer than 10 trucks. Most of these small firms are owner-operators who run their business with just one truck, with the owner at the wheel. Although dominated by small businesses, the trucking sector provides significant employment, supporting jobs for over 7 million people, almost half of them as drivers. Given the prevalence and centrality of trucking to our economy, a number of steps have been taken over the years to improve safety, starting in the 1930s with hours of service limitations, followed by a number of rules and regulations that were subsequently adopted. A wide array of agencies are involved in regulating the trucking industry, including the Federal Carrier Safety Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the National Highway Safety Administration. While the list seems long, each agency is tasked with particular regulations that fit within the particular jurisdiction. 
Although regulations are necessary and important to the public's uh, to the public safety, it is critical that agencies take into account the economic impact of regulations on small firms. As always, the challenge is protecting the public safety while ensuring regulations do not unnecessarily harm or negatively impact small businesses, in this case, small trucking firms. In addition, a thriving truck sector requires a well-maintained infrastructure system. This vital economic artery needs safe bridges and functioning highways to reach its potential. To that end, I am concerned that Congress and the President have yet to move a meaningful infrastructure program that will make necessary and long overdue upgrades. This is an area where I would hope there might be bipartisan cooperation. Today's hearing will provide an important opportunity to evaluate the regulatory environment in which our small truckers operate and fine-tune to the rules so they achieve goals of both safer highways and a thriving, healthy trucking sector. I once again thank the witnesses for being here today and offering uh, their insight. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Gentlelady yields back. And if committee members have opening statements prepared, I'd ask that they be submitted uh, for the record. Uh, and I'd now like to take just a moment to explain our uh, timing and lighting system rules here. Uh, it's pretty simple. You get five minutes. Uh, each of you will get that. And there's a lighting system to assist you. Uh, the green light will stay on for four minutes. Uh, the yellow light will come on, letting you know that you have a minute to wrap up. And then the red light will come on, and you're uh, supposed to stop uh, by then. We'll give you a little leeway, but not a whole lot. So uh, if you can stay within those parameters, we'd greatly appreciate it. I'd now like to introduce our very distinguished panel here this morning. I'm pleased to introduce our first witness, uh, Monty uh, Wiederhold, who is a constituent uh, uh, from our area uh, in Ohio. Mr. Wiederhold is the president of B.L. Reaver uh, Transport Incorporated, a small trucking company located in Maumee, Ohio. Mr. Wiederhold also serves on the board of directors at the Owner Operator Independent Drivers Association, and he's testifying on their behalf uh, today. Uh, we welcome you here today and look forward to your testimony. And our next witness uh, will be Mr. Uh, Marty uh, DiGiacomo. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo is the owner of True Blue Transportation, a small family-owned trucking company located in Harrisburg, North Carolina, that provides trucking and brokerage services throughout the United States, as well as Canada and Mexico. Uh, he's testifying on behalf of the National Association of Small Trucking Companies, and we welcome you here as well. Our third witness will be Mr. Stephen Pelkey. Mr. Pelkey is the president and CEO of Atlas Pyrovision Entertainment Group, a professional fireworks display company located in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Mr. Pelkey also serves on the board of directors of the American Pyrotechnics Association, or APA, and is the chairman of the APA's Transportation Committee. Uh, he'll be testifying on behalf of the APA, and we welcome you here as well, Mr. Pelkey, and look forward to your testimony. And I'd now like to yield to the ranking member to introduce our fourth witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Robert Garbini, the president of the National Ready Mix Concrete Association. Mr. Garbini joined NRMCA in December 1991 as the marketing director of building systems. Prior to joining NRMCA, he was the owner of Foundation Const uh, Constructors in McLean, Virginia, a design-built construction company. The National Ready Mix Concrete Association was founded in 1930 and works to serve the entire ready mix concrete industry, over 80% of which are small businesses. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Wiederholt, you were recognized for five minutes. Chairman Shabbat, Ranking Member Velasquez, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Monty Wiederhold, and I began my career as a professional truck driver in 1973. I have been a small business owner since 1993, and I am the president of BL Reaver Transport Incorporated, a small fleet of seven drivers who, like me, are owner-operators. I have been a member of the Owner-Operator Independent Driver Association since 1983 and serve on its board of directors. I am a proud constituent of Chairman Shabbat's and appreciate his interest in this subject and support for professional drivers. Small trucking businesses represent 96% of motor carriers in the U.S. and are the safest and most diverse operators on the roads. Our activities impact all sectors of the American economy, moving everything from agricultural products to military equipment. 
Unfortunately, the federal government has never grasped the importance of this diversity and continues to burden us with one-size-fits-all regulations which punish small businesses and stifle competition. These costly and burdensome rules are often advanced at the behest of corporate motor carriers who use legislation and regulation to gain competitive advantages over smaller operators like me. Large fleets promote these regulations as a silver bullet solution to improving highway safety despite a distinct lack of evidence. In reality, they are economic weapons used to squeeze smaller competitors out of the market by increasing our operating costs. Continuance of the one-size-fits-all approach makes the federal government complicit in regulating the safest truckers out of the industry. While Congress and the White House have been successful in providing relief on several key matters, it has failed to address serious concerns involving the most disruptive and expensive trucking regulation in history, elect the electronic logging device, or ELD mandate. The ELD mandate is estimated to cost a whopping $1.8 billion annually, yet provides no safety or economic benefit for small business truckers who will bear most of these costs. The rulemaking was approved based upon the false premise that ELDs will increase compliance with hours of service regulations and reduce the risk of fatigue-related crashes. There are also serious complications associated with implementation currently scheduled for December 18th. ELD manufacturers are allowed to self-certify their devices without validation by the FMCSA, and the agency has failed to adequately train law enforcement. While the ELD mandate must be repealed, we believe it would be reasonable and responsible for Congress and DOT to delay implementation until all complications are fully resolved. Over 30 diverse organizations have joined our calls for delay. Many more, including large fleets who championed the mandate, have pursued exemptions. The sheer number of businesses desperate for relief perfectly illustrates what happens when Washington recklessly embraces the one-size-fits-all approach to regulation. OIDA has requested that DOT temporarily exempt small trucking business with exemplary safety records from the mandate. Upon the request, only motor carriers defined <coughs> by the Small Business Administration as small trucking businesses that have a record of no at-fault crashes would qualify and those with an unsatisfactory safety rating from the FMCSA would not be eligible. This exemption would provide temporary regulatory relief to America's safest professional drivers who have safety records that far exceed the large fleet who have been utilizing ELDs for years. The negative attention the ELD mandate has generated has exposed the fact today's hours of service requirements are poorly designed. The rigid and restrictive requirements fail to provide the flexibility drivers need. Instead, these rules push truckers to drive farther and faster. Congress has taken steps to improve HOS, but more can be done to benefit both drivers and highway safety. While professional drivers are dismayed by the lack of relief, Washington has provided on the ELD mandate, and what little progress is made on HOS, we are pleased by recent developments in other policy areas. We thank Congress for directing FMCSA to evaluate, evaluate the effectiveness of the Compliance, Safety, and Accountability Program, which utilizes flawed methodology that does not accurately measure a carrier's safety performance and unfairly penalizes small business operators. Since CSA's inception in 2010, the number of fatalities and injury crashes has increased 14 percent and 55 percent, respectively, according to the FMCSA. A recent National Academy of Sciences review provided numerous recommendations for modifying CSA. These include improving data quality and collection, analyzing how driver turnover rates and levels of compensation impact safety, and, imp and implementing transparency guidelines. We encourage Congress to hold FMCSA accountable in making these changes and fixing CSA. Owner-operators applaud the EPA's recent decision to exempt glider kits from Phase 2 of its greenhouse gas emission standards. Regulations like Phase 2 have dramatically altered small businesses' ability to purchase new or recently owned trucks, making them more reliable and affordable glider kits increasingly attractive. EPA's recommendations of this one-size-fits-all rule is greatly appreciated and should be embraced by Congress. The Trump administration has also withdrawn a rulemaking on increasing the minimum liability insurance level for motor carriers. Today's motor carriers typically carry $1 million in coverage, despite the facts that less than 0.2 percent of truck-involved accidents result in damages that exceed these levels. Some large motor carriers and trial lawyers have sought to increase minimums to well over $4 million. Allowing such dramatic increases would essentially serve as a death sentence for small business truckers to ensure the survival to ensure the survival of small trucking businesses. Congress must follow the administration's lead and reject efforts to increase minimum liability insurance. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to hearing my fellow panelists' testimony and answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiederhall. I think you got more words in that five minutes than <laughs> anybody in the history of this committee, so well done. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Giacomo, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Small Business Panel. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, we are a small trucking company. I do provide brokerage services, been trucking since 79. And I think I got a really good pulse on a lot of different trucking companies, even some that I brokered loads to just this week that are pleading to stop this ELD mandate. 
Uh, there are trucking companies, small family-owned trucking companies that just can't afford to put in $700 GPSs with the companies wanting a one- to three-year contract with fees like $35, $55 a month, whatever. Trucking has always been a fluctuating business. You cannot depend on everything staying exactly the same all the time, as you know, just, the, just by the economy, what it looks like. So these trucking companies, and uh, as uh, Mr. Wiederhold said here, um, you know, it, there's no one size fits all. It cannot work that way because you've got crane companies, you've got towing and recovering, you've got tanker, you've got guys on pipelines, um, food service, which I did before. I mean, I've done a lot of different things, but you cannot put a law, I mean, a, a set of guidelines into place and then try to run it with an electronic log. It's just, it just creates nightmares and havoc and a lot of extra cost. Um, and then, you know, being in the trucking industry this long, I remember the old rules where we could actually take naps when we wanted to, and it would prolong our day. We could say, okay, yeah, we're going to take a nap now because I'm tired. There are times when I go out in the morning or anytime, and, you know, an hour or two later, it's like, I'm really tired. I just got to pull over and take a nap. Well, there's no incentive to do it with the hours of service. So the hours of service right now are connected. The hours of service rules are connected right alongside the ELD mandate. The ELDs should be a choice for trucking companies to uh, take that option if they see that it's going to benefit them. We all want to be safe. Um, representing small business truckers like ourselves and OIDA members and these other guys, we're small business people. We, we feel called to what we're doing. We, we love what we're doing. Um, we're, not, we're not doing it for the money because farming and, and trucking are about the same. The profit margins are so slim, yet, you know, we're being forced to pay for this, pay for that. And as he had mentioned earlier, you know, trying to get these insurance levels up to $4 million. Why? You know, if you're, if you're with General Electric, yeah, you have to have a lot of uh, insurance for problems you might have. But, you know, Larry's Electric, it shouldn't be that way. Same thing with the broker bond. Um, it was initially $10,000. Now they want $75,000. Well, with big companies like C.H. Robinson and TQL, whatever, uh, you know, they do that much business in an hour. So what good is that transportation bond? But again, it's, it's putting the burden on the small business trucker. We had our own brokerage, but we had to get rid of it because we couldn't put up 75000 We had put up 10000 So a lot of these regulations... Um, are, are just killing small businesses. Um, now you've got drivers within our industry that have million and millions of miles of safe driving. How is an ELD law going to help them become any safer than they already are? It's a, it's, a, it's a penalization, like putting training wheels on a guy. Oh, you need training wheels now. You've been doing this 30, 40 years. Yeah, but you know what? You need training wheels. No, that's not the answer. What, what I believe is the answer for safe drivers is training and that's why I'm, a, you know, it's one of the reasons I joined NASTIC. And they have a training program for safety training for the driver members in the organization. And I think, in my opinion, um, you can, you know, an ELD is not going to tell a driver judgmentally what the best thing is to do. It's not going to tell a driver really when he's tired. It's going to arrange for an appointment. You're going to be tired now. You need to go to sleep. You're going to, you're, you need to drive now. And the way the hours of service are set up right now, they force a driver to keep pushing, and the companies will push drivers. And I've been a part of that, so I can give examples, and I can definitely give some examples of how the ELD is a very dangerous um, um, piece of equipment to put in a truck because it's happened to me when I did drive for uh, a couple companies previously that had ELDs. The stress and frustration when you're under that gun with that ELD is so much uh, a problem. And what it does, stress, frustration, and anger about what that thing is there for and what it makes you do actually produces fatigue. And that's what we're supposed to be avoiding here. We don't want fatigue drivers. We don't want drivers with bad attitudes. But that's what the ELD is doing. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Pelkey, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Shabbat, Ranking Member of Velasquez, and other members of the committee. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to appear before you 
today to discuss how federal regulations impact the small trucking industry, issues of vital importance to the U.S. fireworks industry. I am Stephen Pelkey, owner and CEO of Atlas Pyrovision Entertainment Group, headquartered in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, along with my daughter, six daughters, five of which are actively involved in the family business. I serve on the board of directors of the American Pyrotechnics Association, APA, and as the chairman of APA's Transportation Committee. I am here on behalf of the APA and wish to share our industry concerns with the current one-size-fits-all transportation regulations that unfairly harm small business. While this hearing focuses on the impact of federal regulations on the small trucking industry, many industries like fireworks involve private carriage transportation of goods and services. In other words, driving is incidental to the primary business function of loading and unloading tools of trade to provide a specific service. In our case, the setup of and execution of a fireworks display. Our major concern with the current regulatory structure is that small industry stakeholders are continually swept into these one-size-fits-all transportation regulations that are best suited for large commercial companies rather than small family businesses attempting to comply with a myriad of regulations. I'd like to highlight just a few DOT regulations that are extremely challenging and have an unfair and disproportionate impact on businesses. The ALD mandate. The fireworks industry is unique in that it depends upon short-term truck rentals as part of our business model, utilizing them as our primary CMVs to meet the increased transportation activities during the two-week period in and around the Independence Day holiday. After analyzing the significant negative impact that the ELD mandate would impose on the small companies that comprise the industry, APA has worked to support the trial of petition for relief for short-term rental trucks as well as supported legislation by Representative Babin that would provide for a two-year delay in the implementation of this controversial mandate. Unfortunately, these efforts have not succeeded and therefore the APA has recently filed a request for a limited exemption from the ELD mandate during our peak Fourth of July period to coincide with APA's hours of service exemption. We hope that the Department of Transportation will act favorably upon our petition for relief. We are also very concerned about FMCSA's new minimum training requirements for entry-level CMV operators. While the extensive classroom and behind-the-wheel training requirements may uh, well be appropriate for entry-level drivers who desire to drive semi-trailers or operate long-haul commercial vehicles, there is no need to engage in this kind of extensive training for short-haul truck operators moving tools of trade. This type of training is best served by the hands-on training undertaken by each of our companies. Our drivers have for far more knowledge and specific training about their cargo than most full-time CDL drivers working for long-haul companies. Additionally, we remain concerned about Federal Motor Carrier's Hazardous Material Safety Permit Program. This program has been seriously flawed since the inception. While some efforts have been undertaken by the agency to address reforms and recognize the need for providing an additional level of review, much more must be done to provide HMSP holders with some level of assurance that they will simply not lose their permit upon which their livelihoods depend. The APA has widespread concerns regarding the agency's reliance on the behavioral analysis and safety improvement categories or basic ratings and their accuracy in judging a carrier's uh, safety fitness, especially if the agency moves forward in the future with two ratings, fit and unfit. Carriers subject to these complex regulations and potential fitness ratings must be aware of the bar to achieve and maintain a fit rating. A small carrier cannot be judged against all carriers. How can a, f a small family business who relies on a two-week truck rental with very few inspections during the 4th of July holiday be evaluated in the same manner as a 24-7 long-haul commercial trucking company inspected hundreds of times throughout the year? Atlas and the APA are committed to ensuring safety in the transportation, handling, and execution of our fireworks displays. We need reasonable regulations in order to ensure safety, compliance, without placing undue burdens upon our small businesses. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Garbini, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Chabot, Ranking Member Velasquez, and members of the small business uh, community, thank you for the invitation to join you today to discuss the impact of federal regulations on our industry. 
and industries that use LTDs or local de de uh, delivery vehicles, local, de excuse me, local delivery trucks. Thank you. I'm testifying today on behalf of the National Ready Mix Concrete Association's members such as Hilltop Reserves in Ohio District 1 and also uh, DKD Concrete in uh, New York District 7. We represent more than 2,500 companies in our industry with subsidiaries that employ more than 135,000 American workers who manufacture and deliver ready-mix concrete. Roughly 85% of our industry is composed of family-owned and operated small businesses. The industry includes more than 70,000 ready-mix concrete trucks or LTDs, LDTs, and 6,000 ready-mix concrete plants. Ready-mix concrete produces a construction material vital to our economy and environment. From roads to bridges to homes and high-rise buildings, our built environment cannot be realized without the use of ready-mix concrete. In 2016 alone, the ready-mix concrete industry produced 345 million cubic yards of ready-mix concrete. That's roughly one cubic yard per person for everyone in the United States and in excess of $35 billion in, in revenue. Our industry faces unique uh, challenges for uh, LTDs, LDDs. I'm going to get that right sooner or later here. <laughs> Once ready-mix concrete is loaded into a truck, it must be placed and discharged within 90 minutes or it will harden, causing permanent damage to the truck. There is no way that you can cool that material down or prolong it. The per perishable nature of our product means that our industry is intensely local and the average delivery time is just 14 miles round trip from the plant. Because of the uniqueness of the product in our industry, we are often adversely impacted by the federal trucking regulations that are intended for the trucking industry more broadly, both because of the differences in the industry and because of the size of our business. While large companies can readily muster the resources necessary to keep up with, understand, and comply with re federal regulations, the small companies that make up our industry are less able to do so and cons uh, consequently are disproportionately affected by these regulations. Regulation should not be one size fits all. And because it is rarely the case that one size does fit all, the small trucking industry and, and, and its industries that support it are examples of potential uh, companies that are affected adversely by the unintended consequences. In my submitted testimony, I touch on three current and two proposed regulations that impact or will impact the tr small trucking industry. The upcoming mandate from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration regarding the installation of LTD, LTLDs on commercial motor vehicles, as mentioned by others here, represent an outsized burden on the small trucking industry. Similarly, compliance with phase two of the greenhouse gas emissions and fuel efficiency standards for medium and heavy duty engines and vehicles presents a burden that small businesses are less able to shoulder than big businesses. Federal truck weight regulations often force heavy trucks like those used for delivering ready mixed concrete to use local and state roads rather than highways, causing unnecessary wear and tear on roads, those roads, and increasing the cost of ready mixed concrete for delivery. In addition, proposed federal regulations such as the mandatory use of speed limiters and mandatory screening for sleep apnea will have an unduly large adverse impact on the industry and those using uh, the local delivery trucks and on small businesses associated with the industry. These are many instances of theirs where regulations intended to apply broadly disproportionately impact small businesses. I appreciate this committee's dedication to and concern for the plight of the small business person, and I thank you for the opportunity to address these issues. Thank you very much for your testimony, and we want to thank uh, the entire panel for your testimony, and I'll now recognize myself uh, for five minutes to kick off the questioning here. Um, and I'll begin with you, Mr. Wiederhold. Um, what specific costs uh, would your business have to incur to comply uh, with the ELD uh, mandates, uh, and how much of a burden would that be on, on your small business? Well, it's going to be quite a burden. Um, the costs for the ELDs can range anywhere from, there's, I think, about 200 different ones on the market right now. Some of them could be as small as $100. Some of them could be as much as $1,000. Um, 
Uh, then you have monitoring fees that could start anywhere from $30 to $40, $50 a month, depending upon what you want the um, ELD to take care of. Um, and, you know, as a small business, uh, as a fleet like me, I have uh, my wife works in an office at home, and then I have an office uh, manager that she takes care of the dispatch and, uh, you know, filing and things that way. We're not going to realize any savings from this because they talk about a savings that's going to be realized from using ELDs. The big fleets can do that because they've got it figuring their fuel taxes, their, um, you know, cost of operation and things and all like that. So we're not going to be able to realize that. Some companies that uh, have used that are actually going to gain money from the technology because, uh, as referenced in the 2007 Senate hearing, that was held on truck driver fatigue, one company that testified was saving $182,000 in one year because their transmission costs went down $11,000 and they uh, got rid of one position in the office of $50,000, so they, they saved $182,000 in one year. I'm not going to lay Doreen off that works for me because I'm going to save, you know, whatever it is. And if, if you have times seven trucks, if you extrapolate that out, um, if you bought the top line, the top of the line type ELD, you're looking at seven thousand dollars plus monitoring, uh, with no added safety benefit. Okay. Uh, one of my drivers has uh, over thirty four years of zero accidents. Mm -hmm. How is it going to make him any yeah. safer? Thank you. So we're Thank not you. going to realize that. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Giacomo. Let me go to you next. In your testimony, you stated that uh, truck drivers need flexibility uh, when it comes to hours of service and off off duty time. Um, is enough being done uh, currently um, to provide adequate and safe locations for truck drivers to rest? Uh, what what should we be doing in, in addition to address the, that issue? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, <clears throat> no, I don't think that, first of all, the ever since the new hours of service rules went into effect, it uh, with the 10 hours um, consecutive time off, uh, you, you have truck stops filling up a lot earlier now ever since then. Uh, truck parking has become critical, uh, and, you, and you add into that the uh, ELDs in a guy's truck. Uh, my truck got slammed in a truck stop when I was parked at the end because a guy was racing around trying to find a uh, parking spot and uh, you know so we could get his off-duty time started he was running out of hours and um, so th that's that's part of the stress issue the other thing is with the ELDs you know anything can happen on the highway or with your customer and you're not going to end up exactly where you hope to end up to take a rest all the time um, and so you got to have some flexibility now uh, ELDs uh, can put you in spots where there's no facilities, no place to take a shower, no place to brush your teeth, no toilets. So how is that going to be a rest when you've got to take 10 hours off, let's say, on the side of the road? You're, there, there is no rest there. That's, that's another problem with ELDs. Um, and you've got a lot of parking spaces for trucks that are out there now. Even the scale houses don't provide um, uh, facilities. And so, you know, and, and then you've got the uh, issue with uh, a driver if he's parked overnight and there's no facilities. If he gets caught watering down his tires, as they say, um, you know, they, they can, he can be ticketed for indecent exposure, which results often in a uh, sexual offender list you have to sign up on. So, I mean, there's so many uh, issues in this, but also the rest areas, um, uh, if they don't have facilities, are really not a good place to rest overnight. So the, the parking has become a serious problem. And with the ELDs, you could end up in a very bad neighborhood or the wrong place, or uh, a shipper or receiver that you end up to um, load or unload at. They'll say, often they'll say, no, no parking here. Well, where are you going to go? I'm out of hours. That's the, that's the problem. Thank you very much. And Thank my you. time's just about to run out. So Mr. Pelkey, rather than not even get to give you a response, I think I'm going to uh, say my time's expired and I'll now uh, yield to the ranking member uh, thank, for five minutes. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pelkey, uh, Mr. Garbini, I would like to ask my first question to you. The truck mixer is a very specialized uh, vehicle and has many nuances uh, to driving one. Uh, can you elaborate on the unique barriers uh, that your members face as truckers? That, that's an excellent question. Uh, and the the truck itself, if you, I think, 
I'm not sure if Sorry, the mic's thank on. You. Yes, there we are. now it's on. The, the, the vehicle, and I think everyone in this room has probably seen a ready-mix concrete mixer truck. Mm -hmm. It's a mobile uh, manufacturing f uh, facility. So the driver uh, uh, has to have the skill to mix structurally acceptable concrete, have it placed, uh, do it safely, uh, maneuver it onto a construction site. So uh, the that by itself also provides the driver that opportunity to get in and out of the truck. It doesn't have the same qualities as a long haul trucker where you're trying to log that the, the amount of time that he, that man's been, or man or woman's been driving. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pelkey, you represent another type of uh, trucking industry. What would you say uh, are the unique challenges to your members? The biggest challenge I apologize. The, the biggest challenge that we have is that, uh, for one, we are provided an hour service exemption over our busy 4th of July holiday, and that's usually over an 11-day period. And that's for a 14-hour period because we have very unique circumstances where throughout the day they may get time off because they've set up a certain section of the display, they may go back to a hotel room, or they go back to their home, or some somewhere along those uh, particular narrative. Then what happens is with the ELD, that goes away because there's no ELD out there that currently has any program that allows for anyone that has a waiver of sorts in the APA and its member companies aren't able to take advantage of that waiver. waiver. So we lose that. The other unique uh, opposition that we have is that um, between the hours of service, most of our operations, 65, 70 percent of our operations, take place over the 4th of July. And on the 4th of July, you may have drivers that are secondary to their nature of shooting fireworks. They are only driving three or four days a year, subjecting them, if they do not fully comply with an ELD and what, how to program it, they will lose or jeopardize our hazardous material safety permit, which puts us out of business. Thank you. Um, so I would like to uh, ask my uh, Next question to Witherhall and Mr. DiGiacomo. Uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration prohibit carriers, shippers, and receivers from forcing drivers to drive when it might not be safe to do so, provide simple procedures for drivers to file a complaint, and stiff penalties for violations. So my question is, why would these protections be any less effective for a driver using an ELD than they will be for a driver using paper logs? Well, the, the driver could certainly probably file a complaint, but in reality, um, if a driver does too much of that, he's probably going to be finding himself out of a job before long because the carrier, even though there's this, supposedly the harassment issue has been addressed by the FMCSA when, in the final rule, um, we still see instances today, um, and we've had some screenshots. Uh, I don't know if any of you follow some of the Facebook stuff, but there have been screenshots to where um, messages have come across and says you're, you're sleeping with drive time. Why? Mm -hmm. um, or if you can get this load there, um, then we'll fix your log. We'll have safety fix your logs tomorrow. So uh, a lot of people think the ELD mandate, the ELDs can't be uh, altered or cheated. They can be edited. Okay. Any other uh, member? You yes, I would say that uh, there are companies that claim they want to be safe. Um, I drove for one very large carrier that's actually a worldwide company. They carry their own product, and um, they would regularly, and we ran local tanker work, um, they ran regularly uh, pushing us where at the end of the day, we would be done, but they'd say, hey, we got this other run to go out on, and you can go on that uh, exemption uh, for one day this week. So they would send you out on a run, but unless everything worked out exactly perfectly, like nothing ever does in the military either, um, you end up uh, pulling over on the side of the road, calling them, and that's what you had to do. You had to, you had to wait on the side of the road or pull over, and that extended your day. You had to wait for a guy to come out with a pickup. You might be 50 miles away. You might be five. You had to pull over and get that ride. Now you're, now you're extending your day. Now you get home late. You know, you've got to adjust all your logs. Those are some of the things. And, and like he said, 
Um, I was actually fired from that job um, <laughs> for banging my head underneath a trailer on something. He said, that proves you're dangerous. And the reason was I would speak up about true dangerous situations, and I would pre-trip my truck to the point where they were upset because I was actually uh, showing, pointing out things that needed to be fixed. And they don't like people like that. They want a robot. There are certain companies that are like that. And that's one of the issues that um, I've come across. Thank you. Gentlemen, his time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Blum, who's the uh, chairman of the Subcommittee on Agriculture, Energy, and Trade, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Shabbat. T- took me a year, but I can pronounce your name correctly. And, and thank you to our panelists uh, for being here today. Let's start at the 60,000-foot level. Is the trucking industry overregulated? Yes. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. Let the record reflect that. Secondly, are you having trouble finding drivers? Yes. Yes. And what is the reason for that? <clears throat> the One cost- at a time, I guess. I, I would say that the, the, the difficulty in finding drivers has a lot to do with the, with the trade itself. Uh, in, in terms of the ready-mix concrete industry, uh, they're, they're more involved with just than driving a truck. And that goes to my point about the unnecessary uh, requirement for ELDs at this point. Persons in and out of the truck, uh, they're, they're subjected to uh, getting onto a job site and so forth. And quite frankly, it's not just a, a mundane job of sitting in the truck and driving from point A to point B, which is 1,000 miles away. So uh, oftentimes, ready-mix concrete industry, uh, producers are having a lot of difficulty finding individuals that want to get in there and, and be essentially entrepreneurs themselves. For the for the very, very short time uh, period of the year, uh, these truckers um, do not want to go through the training. They don't want to go through the testing process. You have to get a uh, test for your, your CDL. In our cases, whether it's a, uh, a pickup truck or a van, if you have one placardable amount box uh, amount of product into your truck, you need to have a commercial driver's license with a hazmat endorsement. Well, with that requires a certain amount of training. They understand the product, they understand the services involved, but there's a lot of training for two or three or four days out of the entire year. They just, there isn't enough financial incentive in there for them, even with some of these people making 25 or $30 an hour. And if I could say to the uh, perceived driver shortage uh, problem that is being touted by a lot of the big mega carriers, um, there's actually a retention problem where turnover rates exceed 100 percent in a lot of these carriers. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of these carriers actually fashion their business model over the fact that um, they know it's going to be a revolving door process, so we're not going to worry about too much if the guy stays or goes or whatever. And, um, you know, by the FMCSA's own estimates, we have over 400,000 CDLs issued every year. Um, They talk about a a shortage of, like, by 50,000 drivers by 2020. Um, If you extrapolate that out, there's going to be plenty of people. The problem is that the uncompensated uh, loading, unloading time, uh, drivers are paid by the mile or by the load. So when they're sitting in a dock someplace for several hours, they're not getting paid for that. Um, they're gone away from home for a long time. They get tired of missing the kids' birthdays or, you know, wife's an- your aunt- wedding anniversary. So there is a retention problem more so in the, especially, the you know, our segment of the industry there. Um, and I can speak to, I hire only owner-operators, so I'm a little bit more specific in that you have to own your truck to come to work for me. Um, my daughters uh, work at, at an Apple store selling iPhones, iPads, that stuff, and when they have someone come in that's a trucker, and they talk about their dad owning a trucking company, then they say, oh, well, hey, you know, I'm looking for a job. So I think that there's people out there. But um, one of the quick thing here, if wages were adjusted for from 1980 to what they are now, because the average driver's, you know, pay is around 40 cents a mile. If that was adjusted for inflation, you'd have guys making 60 or 70 cents a mile. So the money, the money talks just like it does on anything else. I have a minute left. Uh, And listening to your testimony, testimonies, I was trying to ascertain is what is the bigger issue? Is it the cost of the ELDs or is the inflexibility by industry, the one size fits all of the rules for the LEDs? So 
Just it's, if you could briefly, I've got forty seconds. It's the it's the latter for the latter. Our okay. Is it the cost or is it the inflexibility of the rules? I think it's the cost myself from my standpoint. Cost and and flexibility. Yeah, the inflexibility and, and cost, but uh, primarily the inflexibility. Great, and I'm just about out of time. Thank you very much. I yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yields back. Uh, the gentleman from I think I think we have Mr. Evans next. Is that next in seniority here? Uh, the gentleman, the gentleman from California. I apologize. Okay, gentleman from California, Ms. Chu. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I would like to submit uh, to, uh, for the record, uh, a very compelling letter that was sent to the committee uh, by a coalition of groups, including the Teamsters, uh, regarding uh, the ELDs. Okay. Uh, and I would like no to read, yeah, I'd like to read uh, excerpts from it. It says, our public health, safety, and law enforcement organizations, trucking companies, truck drivers, families of loved ones killed in truck crashes, and truck crash survivors write to express our staunch opposition to any attempts to delay implementation of the long overdue electronic logging device rule. Truck driver fatigue has been a well-documented safety problem in the industry for decades. ELDs are a proven and cost-effective technology that will save lives and reduce injuries and, according to the U.S. Department of Transportation, will result in over $1 billion in annualized net benefits. There is already widespread use of ELD technology in the U.S. and other countries. Nearly a third of trucks currently in service are equipped with ELDs. Similar technology has been used in Europe for decades and is required in the European Union, Japan, and other countries. Members of the trucking industry have known about this rule for years and have ample time to prepare for it. Truck crash deaths and injuries are on the rise. In 2016, 4,317 people were killed in crashes involving large trucks, representing an increase of more than 5% from the previous year and the highest number of fatalities since 2007. We urge the committee to oppose any weakening of this overdue common sense truck safety regulation and it's signed by the Teamsters, the Trucking Alliance, the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association and pages and pages of uh, family members of those who've been killed in truck crashes. And so um, I would certainly like to express my concern about any delay in implementation of this rule. Um, and just changing the topic, I would just like to say that trucking greatly affects my Los Angeles district. 60% of all the goods in the U.S. travel through the ports of L.A. and Long Beach, and 40% of those goods travel through the San Gabriel Valley in my district and then out to the rest of the nation. But with traffic congestion in the area, about one-fifth of commercial trucks experience delays, and in fact, traffic congestion uh, can increase the cost of shipping by 50 to 250%. Uh, in particular, we have routes that are very dangerous. Uh, we have the confluence of state routes 57 and 60 around my district demonstrating this problem. As a result, the Federal Highway Administration identified this 5760 confluence as one of the most 25 most congested freight significant locations in the nation. And that's why we're working, we are working on making improvements uh, through Tiger Grants and so forth uh, to relieve the freight bottleneck. So I would like to ask the panel, can you explain how congested freight corridors like the 5760 impact the ability of your businesses to transport goods across the country? Do congested traffic patterns uh, end up costing your business more? Well, I, I can only uh, answer on our behalf of the fireworks industry. Um, 20 years ago, um, uh, we had virtually all commercial truck drivers were able to haul our fireworks from port to facility. When the hazardous material safety permit was implemented, that was reduced by about half. In the last three years, that's been reduced by as much as 90% of available long haul drivers because they don't want to comply with the hazardous material safety permit program, period. So in that particular case, we've just lost our fundamental need of being able to get our products out of port and had to rely on a lot of our own carriage. Congressman, let me say that our in the ready mix concrete industry, we're not we're not falling into that 
that uh, niche that you just described. We're, our drivers, our delivery of our products, uh, generally are on the average of 14 miles from where the concrete is batched. So we're not, we're not uh, impacting that kind of congestion that you're talking about. In fact, the congestion is oftentimes because of the truck weight limitations is forcing us onto the local roads, damaging those roads instead. Yes, Congressman Chu, uh, I'd like to say that um, um, with those statistics, the ATA represents a lot of the line haul companies that run terminal to terminal. Log uh, ELDs in their trucks are okay. I mean, they work out well, UPS, uh, companies like that where your truck is not running irregular or sitting at a, at a shipper or receiver waiting on um, your uh, shipper to load you. Uh, that's that's where you run into a lot of issues where the ELD and the hours of service come into play. But um, yes, the uh, congestion is a problem because if you, let's say you drive an hour and a half in the morning, you get to a shipper. Um, well, there's a, several trucks there. You might be there, let's say, four hours. So now you're four hours down. Okay, let's say you take a nap. Four hours doesn't count. It doesn't count because there's no incentive for that and it counts against your day. So now you go out, let's say you start driving, but you, um, you know, you, you want to take a lunch, you take a lunch. Um, your hours after that four hours of sitting, and let's say you run into a traffic jam, which is what you're starting to talk about, and like we did coming up here, um, you know, several, several accidents, problems, that really ruins your day right there. Thank you. I yield quick, back. quick answer, Mr. Wiederhold, if you want to. Yeah, I would like to say uh, to uh, Congressman, uh, Congress Lady Chu, that you talk about the, the accidents that happen. Um, depending upon what study you look at, you're, you're talking about 70 to 80 percent of the accidents being the fault of the person driving the car. Um, and fatigue has only played a role, this is according to the FMCSA, uh, less than one and a half percent of the drivers were judged to be fatigued at the uh, time of an accident. And so... And as the driving day goes on, the first hour of driving has with most of the OT recordable accidents and the 9th, 10th, and 11th hour, and even if somebody's caught past that, it is less than 0.9%. So uh, the congestion does play a role as far as the aggravation factor and one of the reasons why a lot of people leave the industry. Okay, the general lady's time has expired. Thank you. Uh, our newest member, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Curtis, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. It's a pleasure to be with you. I would uh, like to just briefly um, thank our four witnesses for being with us today. Um, I owned a small business. As a matter of fact, I suspect uh, that business over the course of many years used uh, at least three of the four of your services. I'm not sure about fireworks. Uh, and uh, I, I know firsthand um, how difficult it is to do what you do every day, and I'd like to thank you. I know keeping the lights on, uh, keeping those employees going, uh, dealing with all the things that you deal with, and then on top of that, dealing with government regulation can be uh, very burdensome. Uh, I also know as a mayor what happens when you drive on my roads, and I have to fix those roads, and uh, so I've seen both sides of this. Um, I'd like to just express my feelings of uh, concern uh, for uh, this legislation and the, the burden that we're putting on you. And I hope that me and my colleagues can find that proper balance um, that's necessary to make sure that our roads are safe and that we're doing the right things, but that we're also not uh, making it too burdensome for you. I'd like to just end by uh, sharing a brief uh, segment of an email that was sent to me. Um, I've been in this uh, role only a few days and uh, I've heard about a lot of issues, but I've actually heard about this from some of my constituents. And the comment that I'd like to share is, uh, this is their livelihood, and most small business owner operators are against this, but will be forced out if they can't comply. And I think we just have to take that very seriously and understand uh, the things that we're considering here. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Tax, and Capital Access, recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think, at least I know I'm not, uh, anyone is against jobs and, and growth. I think we all understand that the best answer to moving the country forward is opportunity. So the question I want to just, it's not really a question, it's a comment. I'm going to ask you to react to it. Uh, the question about it is important that we strike a 
balance to ensure that federal regulations do not impede the growth of small trucking trucking industry. At the same time, the public safety of our truckers, those that share the road with them, is critical. So I'm asking each of you to give me some reaction to how do we strike that balance? Because all that I read and listening to my colleague in terms of the letter she just presented, I'm, I'm interested in your reaction to how do we strike that balance? Well, first off, I'd like to say that by, uh, you know, enacting common sense regulations, um, like the entry level driver training rule, we have finally got into existence now to where, you know, drivers uh, need to be properly trained and not just uh, go to a school for a couple weeks, ride with a trainer. And a lot of times these guys are riding with trainers who have been driving a truck a year themselves. I recall my own experience uh, after one year, you know, riding with my father, there was still a lot to learn, and I'm still learning things every day. So um, those are ways that we can actually move in highway safety forward uh, by, you know, enacting common sense regulations and things and not, um, and, and actually using sound scientific data. So those are, those are things that I think we could do. Um, yes, I, you know, we're all committed to safety. We're, we're family owned companies. You know, I don't care if it's a swift truck or CR England or whatever that has an accident, kills or maims people. It hurts us to see families hurt. So we are committed to safety, which is why, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of that safety training that we take all the time. Like he said, we, we learn things all the time, every day in, in trucking and safety. You can, you're always working towards being a safe driver. But, um, you know, as an example of uh, how I think these ELDs are not the, ish, uh, not the answer for safety is, uh, you know, all these big motor carriers with the ELDs, with all, hiring all these student drivers, their accident rates are very high, and they've got some very serious accidents. And the Walmart driver that killed, uh, um, forget his name, but Tracy Morgan was the survivor, I guess. Okay, he was on, um, it was in his first two hours of driving. So it's, it's like that ELD did not prevent that crash. I was in an uh, incident where um, I had plenty of time with an ELD uh, equipped truck to get to my last stop several years, uh, many years ago. And uh, I was on Route 2 in Western Mass going down that road with, uh, came up behind a dump truck and I started losing time. Going down the mountain, he started doing 25 miles an hour. I was going to, I was, and the rule was if you go over your hours twice in a year, which I already had one, you're fired. I had to start whipping out over that center line looking for a place to pass that guy on a downhill mountain, which I would never do. I finally got past the guy and got down in the town. I didn't have enough time to pull into the place I was delivering to. I had to stop in the middle of the road, put my four ways on, hit on duty, not driving. Did that five more times until I could get into that driveway with people cursing me. You're in the middle of a little road there. And that's, that's, what, that's what the problem with the ELDs is. When you're down to the second, to the minute, when you could have pulled into that place much safer, that's just one example of many I could give. But that's my input. Thank you, Congressman. Safety couldn't be any more important to any one of our members. Uh, we deal with uh, low explosives on a daily basis. Um, a lot of us are family owned. We have our, our sons, our daughters, our husbands, wives that are involved directly in the business. So we, we take safety extremely important. The other problem that we have is the inflexibility of government. And when you say striking a balance, the balance being that we work on holidays. And not every industry is the same. We work on the 4th of July, New Year's Eve. We don't find many uh, long-haul transportation companies that are willing to take two, three, four, five boxes to a particular display site that may be only an hour away from a facility <clears throat> on that particular day. They're just not willing, nor do they possess the HMSP or willing to pass on that expense and all of the regulations that's associated to it. But our member companies are, and they do so at the of their personal family expense. Congressman, one of the common elements from all the four testimonies was one size doesn't fit all. And I think there's got to be a greater examination on this rule to recognize that these, these uh, light uh, delivery trucks for short haul don't fall in the same categories. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back to balance with Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Comer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, this is a big issue in my district. Um, I look at this rule, this 
ELD rule. Uh, this, in my opinion, is the equivalent of Dodd-Frank legislation on small community banks. This is what uh, the same thing that's happening with our small truckers. The uh, Most of the small independent truckers in my district feel like there are two reasons this, this rule uh, became. Uh, it's because the bureaucrats think it's a good idea that have never been in the trucking business and the large, large trucking companies want it to have a further competitive advantage over the small guys. Uh, whatever instance, that's, that's not good for me. I'm going to give you an example of how this affects a huge industry in America, in Kentucky, and especially in my district, agriculture. In Kentucky, we're the largest livestock producing state east of the Mississippi. The further east you go, you still have a lot of cattle. If you look at the price of beef cattle, I'm just using this as an example. The further away from uh, Congressman Blum's district, uh, Congressman Marshall's district, you get, the cheaper the price of cattle is. It can be the same type of cattle, the same weight, the same breed. The difference is the trucking cost to get it to the Midwest where the infrastructure is. When you transport livestock, it's it takes longer than 12 hours, and we have a lot of livestock trucking companies in my district that, that take cattle from the east to the Midwest to where the cattle finishing takes place and the cattle processing takes place. If you don't allow a waiver, if this rule isn't changed for the livestock industry, the price of cattle will be zero east, the further east of the Mississippi you get because if you have to stop and unload those cattle, you can't keep the cattle on the truck or any of the livestock on the truck because they'll get disease, you have shrinkage, they're going to lose weight, uh, they could die. So you have to find a place to unload all those cows. People aren't going to do that. Th that's Industry is going to be gone. The small farmers that you have in, in the eastern part of the United States. So I know that the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration issued a 90-day waiver uh, for the ELD rule for livestock haulers. That waiver is helpful in the short term but it does nothing for the long term. So my question is, what is the best long-term solution to ensure the safety uh, on our way roadways for, for livestock and to continue the viability of the big livestock industry we have, and not just in my district in Kentucky, but throughout the eastern part of the United States? Congressman, I'm going to answer the same way I just did to Congressman Evans. And all four testimonies had the same common element to them, that one size doesn't fit all. There's right. got to be a greater examination uh, and to give relief to situations like what you just described. I, and, I, and I think an important point to bring out is whenever we, my personal circumstance in the 33 years that I've been in business is that we are handed regulation and then are told deal with it. Right. And dealing with it tends to you make mistakes. You're, you're trying to comply. You're trying to figure out how to comply. And the end result is, however, we're inspecting you and you didn't do steps three, four, and five correctly. You did one great, you, your heart was in the right place, mm -hmm. your mind was in the right place, but you just didn't get the job done. Therefore, here's $2,500 fine and try to do better next time. From my standpoint, um, even as just a consumer, um, and I actually broke into the industry hauling cattle Good. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, absolutely. I didn't quite go the distance that you're talking, but still, nonetheless, you, you have to, uh, you're talking about livestock here. It's not a load of freight. Right. So, um, but as a consumer, you know, you're talking about dealing with the food chain of our country. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have such a great, efficient transportation system enables food to be delivered, uh, you know, all kinds of goods to be delivered at a low cost uh, to the consumers. And if I might throw this in also is that, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, the, the funding of our highways and stuff today um, and not really want to raise fuel taxes. But and everybody benefits from that, you know, to, uh, you know, whether you never get out and drive on the highways. But if you're going to have stuff delivered from Amazon or whoever it is, and that's a big thing right now, you know, the right. shopping season. So that that all plays into that. So that that's something that we need to consider. Uh, thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is a ranking member of Subcommittee on Health and Technology. It's recognized for five minutes. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome uh, uh, to the committee. And, and one of the uh, the areas that she was talking about is one size does not fit all, and I, and I can see that it's uh, we talked about more and more this morning. Uh, and I was trying to get my hands around it because when I was in uh, college, uh, I was in Michigan, and I, and I worked for this company called Avante Express, where they traveled all over Michigan, uh, but we had very little training uh, on those trucks before we were traveling all, all over Michigan. I was working with a guy from Czechoslovakia who couldn't speak English, and I had a map, and, and we went back and forth, <laughs> yeah, you know, trying to make things happen and, and trying to, uh, but, but, but at that time, we could only be on the road about eight hours. You know, today I think you can be on the road about, what, 11 or 12 hours? 11 hours, okay. And so, uh, but we violated all of the principles, you know, because a lot of time we just couldn't make it uh, in eight hours spread, but we, you know, we had to really get back. Uh, my concern is uh, 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 there are a lot of regulations uh, that you all have to uh, uh, com confront it with. And with those regulations that you're confronted with, uh, what is the best thing that you can offer uh, to this committee that we can work on uh, to make changes so we don't put so much pressure on the small business compared to the larger trucking firms? And, and I think that's extremely important. Well, you know, we're not looking, uh, as small business truckers, we're not looking for uh, any type of specific advantage, like we want the rules to apply to the big guys and not apply to us. We're not looking for that. We're all working within the rules we have right now. Um, but the present hours of service has zero flexibility. And prior to 2003, we operated under maybe the rules you're talking about, the eight hour. That was, you had to have, you could drive 10 hours and you had eight hours off. You could take your breaks as you wanted to. You weren't penalized because you didn't lose work time down the, you know, on later on in the day because if you took a two-hour break, your clock was stopped, whereas today the, the clock doesn't stop. It keeps going. It only stops if you have eight hours. Um, so the, the present hours of service is a huge, huge hindrance, and it, again, it penalizes drivers for trying to take the opportunity to be safe. Um, and with regard to, like, the 14-hour rule, uh, I have – had personal experience having to skip eating someplace because I wasn't going to get to my destination in time before my 14-hour clock. You know, you're allowed 11 hours of driving and three hours of on-duty time or whatever. Actually, 13 and a half now because we have a 30-minute break rule that we have to take before we acquire eight hours of, of on-duty time. And that, that is another source of frustration because many drivers, and I haven't talked to anybody that sees any merit in that. That's one of those rules that, that, that is another one that you just scratch your head with. I'd also agree with that. That's one of the biggest problems with the inflexibility and that half-hour break that they tell us we have to have with a combined eight hours of on-duty and on-duty driving. Um, what, a, what a big mess that is. In any other industry, a half-hour break is a lunch. Why don't we be able to take our lunch when we want to? And um, previously, uh, the 10 hours that you could drive with the eight hours off, and you could break up that eight hours however you wanted to. And the teams today, that's why you don't have many teams anymore. You can't break up your sleeper time. They relegate that, that other driver to the sleeper for 10 straight hours. That is torture. I've run team a long time, uh, years ago. So you, here's what I think is really part of the answer is the ELD is not going to give safe results. It does not really get the, get the result that we want. I'll tell you what I think is uh, the answer is good, substantial training. A lot of these big mega carriers, I'm not saying they all do this, but they don't train the drivers really well. And so that's why you've got guys going down Donner Pass and, you know, losing his brakes and they both flipped over and they're killed. You know, it's a famous uh, video. So I'm going to let the other guy speak. In driving for us is incidental to our business. We uh, Most of our jobs are less than two hours from the site. So we're only driving on the road anywhere between one and three hours in any given day. And it was the reason why Federal Motor Carrier had granted us a 14-hour hours of service exemption during our busy Fourth of July holiday over that 11-day period because we have a proven safety record of on-the-road driving. And the reason for that is because of the uniqueness of our 
organization that all of our member companies that arrive to a display site, they do some work, they may take some time off, they may go to a hotel room, their own home, because there are different crews that do different phases of a particular job, and but at the end of the day, they've only driven an hour, they may have to drive a half an hour to get their equipment back home, and but it would be within that 14-hour period. Mr. Garbini, did you want to get an answer in there real quickly? I just wanted to comment that I think your your search here and questions for trying to find a solution for this is well founded. I think it it, it lays with, uh, quite frankly, uh, working with industry in the small business side to come up with with rules that make sense. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Gentlemen's time has expired. Yeah, you, Thank you very much. The uh, gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Knight, who is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Contracting and Workforce, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple things. I come from California. We have gone through uh, a litany of different things that we can um, embattle the trucking industry. Uh, the particulate filters that we have gone through over the last eight or ten years, I was in the legislature when that happened. and. And a lot of the companies came forward and they bought those early particulate filters. Uh, a lot of engines were catching on fire. Their MPG was going down. Their, their uh, ability to haul was going down. Um, it was amazing those first couple of years. Now we've kind of gone into the new filters and it's still a, a mess in California over many different areas of conversation but uh and then we went through the new motors uh you could only have a certain amount of uh or certain types of motors and so the trucking industry wanted to come forward and buy the latest one to get them the furthest down the road and so we dealt with many of the big manufacturers and said you know by 2025 you have to have this motor and so the industry said well we'd just like to buy that well, the interesting thing was they didn't build that motor at the time. And so they had to buy the next stage of motor and then the next stage. And it just turned into a big mess. It's still a big mess in California. Um, so we've gone through this and we've um, not listened to the trucking industry. We've listened to the politicians to write the laws and you've got to deal with it. So all that being said on the ELD, is there ever going to be a time where you say that you know, we've got to upgrade to something that will be um, better for the trucker, better for the industry, better for the owners, and it will be um, of this higher advanced over uh, maybe just taking your log, maybe doing it on your own and things like that. Or would you say that the log and, and how it is done today is the best way that we can do it? And that, that might come from the industry, that might come from owners. Go ahead, sir. Well, we're not against the technology by any stretch. Um, we're just against it being mandated because, uh, again, as, as speaking to the bulk of our membership being single truck owner operators, and I spoke to it before, um, there's only going to be a cost. There's not going to be a savings because, I mean, outside of a guy is just lazy as far as figuring his fuel taxes. If you wanted to have a, a program that, that takes care of your fuel taxes that you're going to pay 40 or $50 a month for to keep track of, then, you know, maybe. But, I mean, that. that the technology itself we're not against, but the mandate is what we're opposed right. to. Okay. Sir. Uh, yes, I would say that, um, you know, in, in the FMCSA's own words, there's only a small percentage of drivers that are abusing the system. There's, you know, some problem drivers. Well, just like if you have uh, guys that are convicted of DWI in a town, well, put a breathalyzer in their car. Don't put it in everybody's car. Why penalize everybody if they don't want it? How about if it was a choice? If it's going to benefit my business and help me to be safer, I will definitely buy it if it's going to help me be safer. Um, but in my, my personal opinion, uh, drivers that have been in this a long time and have great safety records, um, no serious in, you know, instances of um, irresponsible driving, they don't even need a logbook. They, they've been in it long enough. They have the... They have the the maturity to run without a log and they would still be safe. So um, at some point I could see possibly looking into it if it's going to benefit me and if it will really contribute to my safety. But the hours of service is the biggest problem right next to. The okay. And, and a quick question on my last minute here. Uh, the industries, does, does the uh, trade organizations in the industry come forward with ideas every year to say, Hey, look, this is going to make us safer. This is going to make us more efficient. 
Uh, this is going to make it so we can make more money. All of those things are very important. Well, and, and I think, I, I guess I would put it on behalf of our American Pyrotechnics Association, have put forth uh, continuously, have worked um, tenaciously as far as getting and working with Federal Motor Carrier on giving options. And I think a lot of that has been uh, given back by Federal Motor Carrier by granting our hours of service exemption. So we've proven as an industry and worked with Federal Motor Carrier to say that yes, you have a very safe record over this strong period of time that you do business. But many of our members only have one or two trucks. And I don't think that right. they they have a problem with those particular ELD mandates for those uh, particular trucks. But we were 90%, 30, I believe 3,600 rental trucks that we rely on from vans, 15-foot trucks to 26-foot trucks from budget, rider, Penske, whatever they may be, to transport for two weeks out of the year, to put equipment in and out of these trucks on a daily basis, depending on what status a particular driver is in, is just too problematic and just something that Federal Motor Carrier just doesn't want to deal with. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, Ms. Alan Adams, uh, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Investigations, Oversight, and in Regulations, recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, gentlemen, uh, for being here and for your testimony. Um, a common theme among those opposed to the ELD rule is that they are too costly for small businesses to afford. But just a, a cursory review shows that there are several ELD options that come with no upfront costs and with uh, monthly service fees as low as ten dollars. Um, in addition, uh, the um, FMCSA estimates that drivers will save approximately twenty hours per year in time uh, they'd otherwise spend filling out paper, uh, and everything is kind of moving toward um, uh, toward computers and technology. So um, why wouldn't they, um, if, um, so why wouldn't they benefit from adopting the ELDs? I mean, I've, I've listened, listened attentively, but it seems to me it's just a, a change from paper to something else. So anybody can comment. Well, as far as it goes, um, you know, the, uh, the ELD, you still have to put in uh, things on your log, like your bill of lading number, the who the shipper is, what kind of cargo you're carrying, those things will still have to be entered whether you have a paper log or an ELD log. Um, and this this savings of time is uh, mythical at best, I'm sorry, but uh, when I'm doing my log as I keep it up during the day, uh, it's probably, I don't know, three or four minutes maybe at that. And so um, there's not going to be this savings in time that they talk about. And uh, the the Drivers don't get paid by the hour anyway. They get paid by the mile or the load. Okay. Yeah, I would also say that uh, those statistics that they give, you might want to check, you know, who gave that statistic. Maybe it's the manufacturer. Rand McNally is uh, the biggest name. Um, they claim to be the world's leader in maps because of their uh, relationships with states and local municipalities, but yet I've owned two of them. I'm on my, you know, for several years, and I can tell you that the glitches and problems with that are consistent. They they are never-ending. They're not accurate, and they never should have been put out on the market, uh, and that's what you're going to end up with is a gadget that is going to have problems, and that's why we still have to carry, according to the ELD mandate, we still have to carry a paper log in the truck. Why? Uh, well, they don't, <laughs> they're not going to work all the time. And the other issue is, um, you know, if you're going to invest in something, you, you want to make sure it's going to be working all the time and not a problem to your truck. Um, I haven't done a lot of research on them because my truck's too old. I'm not going to put one in. But um, the, uh, a buddy of mine told me about uh, the company that he's leased to is forcing all their drivers to take this one. And it comes with a, um, a disclaimer. If you have any problems with the engine light coming on or any engine problems that occur, quickly disconnect this. Well, what, what, what do you got to do? Pull over? Okay. So all these companies that are coming out with these, what kind of quality are they? Are they are they guaranteed to work? And, and there you go. That's good. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my comment is that the the having a, a electronic device mandated on all vehicles, again, regardless of, of the size of the company or the length of drive, 
that each one of the uh, uh, drivers may have in a day uh, is, is kind of a rationalization that electronics are going to be the solution. A company has to be committed to safety to begin with. And if they are doing that, and, and I think the question earlier from the congressman on, on the other end here, uh, if, the committee, if the company is committed to safety, the, the paper log uh, is going to work fine. It's, it's the whole issue is really making it mandatory. In, in our particular industry, we, uh, in the fireworks industry, in the American Pyrotechnics Association, we don't really have an hours of service problem. And we have a safety issue, uh, a lack, we don't have a safety issue problem that we have, especially over the two-week period of Fourth of July. And the cost, uh, we've been, many member companies have been using ELDs for probably uh, off and on over the last year and a half. And there are costs. There are costs associated because you have a monthly fee, whether you rent it, you purchase it, or and then a database fee for each individual driver. So that ranges anywhere between $200 and $300 per year per driver. And then on top of that, if they don't fill it out properly, in our uniqueness of our business, and if they have too many out-of-service conditions, what will happen is they'll lose their hazardous material safety permit. For a fireworks industry, that's their lifeblood. You might as well take their driver's license away and they're done. And that's the caveat that Federal Motor Carrier has over many of our member industries. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Chair, you're back. The, thank you, General Lady Yields back. The uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, who is the uh, sponsor of the ELD uh, Extension Act of 2017, is recognized for five minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be back in here. And uh, I... Uh, I had recently, our office had sent a letter to the president uh, asking for a delay for all sectors of the trucking industry um, until April the 1st. And uh, since then, DOT has uh, granted uh, a waiver uh, for three months to uh, ag haulers and cattle, uh, cattle haulers. And so I think that's proof that uh, DOT certainly has the uh, authority to to grant a waiver to whomever they wish in the uh, in this process. Uh, do, do I'd like to hear from what each of you thinks? Is it would that be something that you would be in agreement that all sectors of our trucking industry should have a waiver of a, of a temporary period of time, like the three months that the cattle and the ag haulers have? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think it's a laudable thing. I think that uh, it actually needs to go farther than that, but. Uh, any any uh, reprieve to work out some of these problems associated with it would be welcome. I would agree and that it does need to go further. And uh, just a quick comment, um, if, if logs were the answer to safety, why does the government on FEMA loads throw them out the book, uh, fl throw out the log book for all the drivers if we're running FEMA loads? And there's 26 states still operating with all these trucks bringing emergency relief, fuel, propane. These guys are running way over their hours. They don't, it does, it's not a problem. What happens if my customer has a problem with a, a plant shut down and I got to get something there so people won't be out of work? Um, what's the difference between what the government allows and what our customers might need? Right. And currently, APA members are granted a 14-hour hours of service waiver for an 11-day period over the 4th of July, uh, busy 4th of July holiday. And any ELD use that we are mandated to use basically nullifies that waiver that they've already admitted that we have a very safe track record and uh, have established that over at least a, a dozen or so years of a uh, impeccable safety record associated with that time period that we celebrate and uh, perform these displays that probably the nation's fireworks displays, 70% of all displays performed in that two-week period. I think your, your example of, of the, the, uh, the relief that was given to the uh, uh, haulers, the livestock haulers, is evidence, again, that, a, that the federal government and the agency, uh, uh, Motor Carrier Safety, uh, have recognized that there's some flaws to this whole thing. There needs to be time taken with a stay on the entire process and have industry work with the regulators to come up with common sense. One size does not fit all across the board. Absolutely. And then, uh, you know, I'd also say uh, to uh, my colleagues um, that if a company likes their ELD and, and there's, a, there's a history of it, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some of these companies really do, uh, 
Uh, but I've talked to uh, far more of my uh, of my constituents and and also outside my district who who drive uh, that they have grave concerns about uh, the unknowns and the question marks uh, regarding it and how just how safe it is. But if if it saves the company money, uh, if it if it if it actually does uh, make the highway safer, and they found that each individual company finds that. Uh, then certainly I would, uh, uh, I'm not trying to abolish uh, by any stretch of the imagination uh, ELDs. Uh, keep using them. Uh, you know, in the words of, uh, of our previous administration, if you like your ELD, you can keep your ELD. Uh, so uh, that's, that's all we're, uh, that, that we're trying to do, uh, and that is to, to get, get a little time, find out how these things work, get some testimony, uh, we know that the previous administration said there would be a $2 billion compliance cost on this thing. And uh, so I, I, th I think it's not unreasonable to ask uh, for a, 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 a waiver for a short period of time that we can answer these questions. But anyway, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. And I want to thank the panel for their uh, excellent testimony here this, uh, this morning and now this afternoon. Um, as there's no question that the American economy relies heavily on the trucking industry, and, uh, and, and so therefore this is a uh, very important issue for us to consider. Uh, we, of course, understand that there is some disagreement between some of the small, probably all of the small trucking companies and some of the larger, and, and obviously the association that's one of the more significant ones in the trucking industry too. So, um, But we, we thought that we ought to do our part as the small business committee to make sure that there was an opportunity there for you to uh, to let this committee know and we'll let our colleagues know what we're hearing and as i stated at the beginning we're also uh, inviting uh, those with an opposite point of view to to submit in writing uh, their their point of view so we can consider that as well um, and i would ask unanimous consent that members i have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record without objection so ordered and if there's no further business to come before the committee we're adjourned. Thank you very much.